Hi and welcome to another story and today we have part three of the story of Tracy Beaker by Jacqueline Wilson. Continuing from page 80. Then Cam looked up. She caught my eye. She did ask me. Have a go, she said, dead casual. I gave this little shrug as if I couldn't care less. Then I sauntered forward very slowly. I held up my hand for the pen. This is Tracy, said Jenny, poking her big nose in. She's the one who wants to be a writer. I felt my face start burning again. What, her, said Justine. You've got to be joking. Now, Justine, said Jenny. Tracy's written heaps and heaps in her life book. Yeah, but it's all rubbish, said Justine, and her hand shot out and she made a grab underneath my jumper where I was keeping the book for safety. I bashed out at her, but I wasn't quick enough. She snatched the book from me before I could stop her. Give that here, I shrieked. It's rubbish, I tell you. Listen, said Justine, and she opened my book and started reading in a silly, high-pitched baby voice. Once upon a time, there was a little girl called Tracy Beaker, and that sounds stupid, and no wonder, because I am stupid, and I wet the bed, and... Ow! Things got a bit hazy after that, but I got my book back, and Justine's nose became a wonderful scarlet fountain. I was glad, glad, glad. I wanted her whole body to spout blood, but Jenny had hold of me by this time, and she was shouting for Mike, and I got hauled off to the quiet room. Only I wasn't quiet in there. I yelled my head off. I went on yelling when Jenny came to try and calm me down, and then Jenny went away, and someone else came into the room. I wasn't sure who it was at first, because when I yell, my eyes screw up and I can't see properly. Then I made out the jeans and the t-shirt and the shock of hair, and I knew it was Cam What's it? And that made me burn all over until I felt like a junior Art Joan of Arc. There was me, throwing a hairy fit, and there was her standing there watching me. I don't care about people like Jenny or Elaine seeing me. They're used to it. Nearly all children in care have a roaring session once in a while. I have them more than once, actually, and I usually just let rip. But now I felt like a right raving loony in front of her. But I didn't, that, I didn't stop yelling all the same. There was no point. She'd already seen me at it and heard me too. She didn't try to stop me. She wasn't saying a word. She was standing there, and she had this awful expression on her face. I couldn't stand it. She looked sorry for me. I wasn't having that. So, I told her to go away. That's putting it politely. I yelled some very rude words at her, and she just sort of shrugged and nodded and went off. I was left screaming and swearing away all by myself. But I'm okay now. I'm not in the quiet room anymore. I stayed in there ever such a long time, and I even had my tea in there on a tray. But now I'm in my bedroom. And I've been writing and writing and writing away. And it looks like I can't help being a writer. I've written so much, I've got a big lump on the longest finger of my right hand. I used to play this daft game with my fingers. I'd make them into a family. There were Mummy Finger and Daddy Finger, Big Brother Freddy Finger, Pretty, pretty Little Pinky Finger and Baby Fumkin. I'd give myself a little puppet show with them, making them jump about. And I'd take them for walks up and down the big hill of my leg and I'd tuck them up for the night in my hanky. Baby Camilla used to like that game ever so much. I'd give the Finger family different squeaky voices, and I'd make them talk to her, and take it in turns to tap her tiny little nose, and she'd always chuckle so much her whole body jumped up and down. I don't half miss Camilla. Hey, sudden thought, Cam is short. Is Cam short for Camilla? I was delighted at breakfast to see that Justine has a swollen nose and a stinking plaster. <laughs> the swollen nose matches her swollen head. Justine Littlewood thinks she's really it, and she isn't. I truly don't get what Louise sees in her. If I were Louise, I'd much sooner be Tracy Beaker's best friend. What really gets me is that I was the one who piled up with Justine first. She turned up at the home one evening, all down and droopy because her mum had cleared off with some bloke and left Justine and her two little brothers and her dad to get on with it. Only her dad couldn't get on with it, and the kids got taken into care. The brothers got into a short-term foster home because they were still nearly at the baby stage and not too much bother, but Justine didn't get taken on too because they thought she'd be difficult. I generally like kids who are difficult, and I thought I liked the look of Justine and the sound of her, because after the first droopy evening, she suddenly found her tongue and she started sounding off at everyone, getting really stroppy and swearing. She knew even more swear words than I do. She was like that all week, but she shut up on Sunday. Her dad was supposed to see her on Sunday. She was sitting waiting for him right after breakfast, though he wasn't supposed to be coming till 11 o'clock. 11 came and went, and 12. And then it was dinner time and Justine couldn't eat her chicken. She sat at the window all afternoon, not budging. My tummy went tight whenever I looked at her. I knew what it was like. I used to sit like that, not just here, I used to wait at both my crummy foster homes and the children's homes in between, waiting for my mum to come. 
But now I've got myself sorted out. No more dumb sitting about for me, because my mum's probably too far away to come on a quick visit. Yeah, that's it. She's probably abroad somewhere. She's always fancy travelling. She's maybe in France or Spain. She likes sunshine. What am I thinking of? She'll have gone to the States, maybe Hollywood. My mum looks so great, she'd easily get into the movies. You can't hop on a bus and visit your daughter when you're hundreds of thousands of miles away in Hollywood. Now, can you? All the same, even though I don't sit waiting. I always go a bit tingly when there's a knock at the door. I hold my breath, waiting to see who it is just in case. So, I could understand what old Justine was going through. I didn't try to talk to her because I knew she'd snap my head off, but I sort of sidled up to her and dropped a lollipop on her lap and backed away. It wasn't exactly my lollipop. I'd snaffled several from little Wayne. His dopey mum is younger than Adele, and she hasn't got a clue about babies. Whenever she comes, she brings Wayne lollipops. Well, they've got sticks, haven't they? We don't want little Wayne giving himself a poke in the eye, and he's normally so drooly that if you add a little, little bit of lolly stick on lolly lick as well, he gets stickier than superglue. So it's, a real, it's really a kindness to nick his not lollies when he's not looking. But why did you want to give one to that Justine, Louise asked. She's horrible. Tracy, she barged right into me on the stairs yesterday and she didn't even say sorry. She just called me a very rude word indeed. Louise whispered it primly. Um, did she really say that? I said, giggling. Oh, she's not so bad, really. And anyway, I didn't give her the red lollipop. I saved that for you. Thanks, Trace, said Louise, and she beamed at me. Oh, we were like that in those days. I kept an eye on Justine. She didn't budge for a good half hour, letting the lollipop lie in her lap. And then I saw her hand creep out. She unwrapped it and gave it one small, suspicious lick, as if I'd poisoned it. But it must have tasted okay, because she took another lick, and then another, and then she settled down for a good long suck. Lollipops can be very soothing to the stomach. She didn't say thank you or anything, and when she eventually had to give up waiting and go to bed, she stalked off by herself. But the next day at breakfast, she gave me this little, little nod. So I nodded back and flicked one cornflake in her direction, and she flicked one back. And we ended up having this good game of tiddly flakes. And after that, we were friends. Not best friends. Louise was my best friend. Ha! <laughs> she moaned at first. Why do we have to have that Justine hanging around us all the time, she complained. I don't like her, Trace. She's dead, no, she's dead tough. Well, I want to be tough too. You've got to be tough. What do you mean, I'm tougher than Justine? I said, sticking my chin out. Nutter, said Louise. It started to get to me, though. I started swearing worse than Justine, and Jenny got really mad at me because Maxie started copying me, and even little Wayne would come out with a right mouthful when he felt like it. So, then I started the dare game. I've always won any dare until Justine came along. I dared her to say the rudest word she could think of when the vicar came on a visit. And she did. She dared me to go out of the garden stark naked. And I did. I dared her to eat a worm. And she did. She dared me to eat a worm. I said that wasn't fair. She couldn't copy my dare. So Louise opened her big mouth and said that I hated worms. Then I dare her to eat two worms, said Justine. So I did. I did. Sort of. It wasn't my fault that they made me sick. I did swallow them first. Justine said I just spat them out straight away, but I didn't. I fought hard. I happen to be a crack hand at skateboarding. Justine's not much good at that, getting her balance and her steering's rotten. So I fixed up this skateboard assault course round the garden, with sloping benches and all sorts, and I dared Justine to have a go. So she did. She fell over a lot, but she kept getting up and carrying on. So I said she was disqualified. But Louise said Justine could still win the bet if she completed the course. And she did. Then Justine dared me to climb the tree at the end of the garden. So I did. It wasn't my fault I didn't get right to the top. I didn't ask that stupid Mike to interfere, but Justine said I'd lost that dare, and Louise backed her up. I couldn't believe my ears. Louise was my friend. We couldn't do any more dares because Jenny put her foot down. You don't argue when she does that. The next day, Justine's famous dad put in an appearance at long last. Justine had gone on and on about how good-looking he was, just like a pop star, and he actually had an evening job singing in pubs, which is why he couldn't be at home to look after her and her brothers. Well... You should have seen him. Starting to go bald, pot belly, medallion. He wasn't quite wearing a frilly shirt and flares, but almost. You wouldn't catch me wanting a dad like that. But Justine gave a weird little whoop when she saw him and jumped up into his arms like a great big baby. He took her on some dumb outing, and when she got back, she was all bubbly and bouncy and showing off this, this present he'd bought her. I don't know why, but I felt really narked at Justine. 
It was all right when she didn't get a visit, like us lot, but now I kept picking on her and saying silly, sniggery things about her dad, and then she burst into tears. I was a bit shocked. I didn't say anything that bad, and I never thought a really tough girl like Justine would ever cry. I don't ever cry, no matter what. I mean, my mum hasn't managed to come and visit me for donkey's years, and I don't even have a dad, but catch me crying? And then I got another shock, because Louise turned on me. You are horrid, Tracy, she said. And then she put her arms right around Justine and gave her a big hug. Don't take any notice of her. She's just jealous. Me? Jealous? Of Justine? Of Justine's dopey dumb dad? She had to be joking. But it didn't look like she was joking. She and Justine went off together, their arms around each other. I told myself I didn't care, although I did care a little bit then. And I did wonder if I'd gone over the top with my remarks. I can have a very cutting tongue. I thought I'd smooth things over at breakfast. Maybe even tell Justine I hadn't really meant any of it. Not actually apologise, of course, but show her that I was sorry. But it was too late. I was left on my own at breakfast. Louise didn't sit next to me in her usual seat. She went and sat at the table by the window with Justine. Hey, Louise, I called. And then I called again, louder. Have you gone deaf or something? I yelled. But she could hear me all right. She just wasn't talking to me. She wasn't my best friend anymore. She was Justine's. All I've got is silly, squitty, twitty Peter Ingham. Oh, maybe he's not so bad. I was writing all this down when there was this tiny tapping at my door, as if some timid little insect was scrabbling away out there. I told this beetle to buzz off because I was busy, but it went on scribble-scrabbling, so eventually I heaved myself off my bed and went to see what it wanted. Do you want to play, Tracy? he said. Play? I said witheringly. What do you think I am, Peter Ingham? Some kind of infant? I'm busy writing. But I've been writing so much my whole arm ached, and my writing lump was all red and throbbing. Oh, how we writers suffer for our art. It's chronic, it really is. So, I did just wonder if it was time for a little diversion. What sort of games do you play then, little Peter Peetle Beetle? He blinked a bit and shuffled backwards as if I was about to squash him, but he managed to squeak out something about paper games. Paper games, I said. Oh, I see. Do we make a football out of paper and then give it a kick so it blows away? What fun! Or do we make a, a dear little teddy out of paper and give it a big hug and squash it flat? Even better. Peter giggled nervously. No, Tracy. Pen and paper games. I always used to play noughts and crosses with my nan. Oh, gosh. How incredibly thrilling, I said. Beetles don't understand sarcasm. Good. I like noughts and crosses too, he said, producing a pencil out of his pocket. There was no deterring him. So we played paper games after that. I suppose it passed the time a bit. And now I've just spotted something. Right at the bottom of the page, in tiny, teeny, beetle writing, there's a little message. Guess what? I've got a letter. Justine Littlewood's father met my nan at the sewage works. And I don't half like you, Tracy, signed Peter Ingham. Not another soppy little message from Peter. A real private letter that came in the post addressed to Miss, Miss Tracy Beaker. I haven't had many letters just recently. Oh, there have been plenty of letters about me. Elaine's got a whole library of files on me. I've had a secret rifle through them, and you should just see some of the mean, horrid things they say about me. I had a good mind to sue them for libel. Yeah, that would be great. And I'd get awarded all these damages, hundreds of thousands of pounds, and I'd be able to thumb my nose at Justine and Jenny and Elaine and all the others. I'd just clutch my lovely lolly in my hot little hand and go off and... Well, I'd have my own house, right? And I'd employ someone to foster me. But because I'd been paying them, they'd have to do everything I said. I'd order them to make me a whole birthday cake to myself every single day of the week, and they'd just have to jump to it and do so. I wouldn't let anybody else in to share it with me, not even Peter. I had to share my real birthday cake with him, and he gave me a nudge and said, What's the matter, Tracy? Don't you feel well? Just when I'd closed my eyes tight and was in the middle of making my birthday wish. So, it got all muddled and I lost my thread, and now, if my mum doesn't come for me, it's all that Peter Ingham's fault. Well, maybe it is. But I'd still let him come round to my house sometimes, and we could play paper games. They're quite good fun, really, because I always win. Who else could I have in my house? I could try and get Camilla. I'd look after her. I could get a special playpen and lots of toys. I've always liked the look of that all, all that baby junk. I don't suppose I had much of that sort of thing when I was a baby. Yeah, I could have a proper nursery in my house, and when Camilla wasn't using it, I could muck about in there, just for a laugh. I wonder if Camilla remembers me now. That's the trouble with babies. I wonder if Cam is short for Camilla. That's who my letter was from. I was a bit disappointed at first. I thought it was from my mum. 
I know she's never written to me before, but still, when Jenny handed it to me at breakfast, I just clutched at the envelope and I held it tight and shut my eyes quick because they got suddenly hot and prickly. And if I was a snivelly sort of person, I might well have cried. What's up with Tracy? The other girls mumbled. I gave a great swallow and sniff and opened my eyes and said, nothing's up. Look, I've got a letter, a letter from, I think it's maybe from Cam Lawson, Jenny said very quickly indeed. I caught my breath. Yeah, uh, Cam Lawson. See, that? She's written me my own personal letter. And she's not written to any of you lot. See, she's written to me. So, what does she say then? Never mind, it's private. I went off to read it all by myself. I didn't get around to it for a bit. I was thinking all these dopey things about my mum, and I had a bad attack of hay fever, and I didn't really want to read what Cam Lawson had to say anyway. She saw me having my hairy fit. I was scared she'd think me some sort of loony. Only the letter was okay. Dear Tracy, we didn't really get together properly when I came on my visit. It was a pity because Jenny told me a bit about you and I liked the sound of you. She said you're very naughty and you like writing. I'm exactly the opposite. I've always been very good, especially when I was at school. You wouldn't half have teased me. I'm not quite so good now, thank goodness. And I hate writing because it's what I do for a living. And every day I get up from my cornflakes and go and sit at my typewriter and my hands clench into fists and I go cross-eyed staring at the blank paper. And I think, what a stupid way to earn a living. Why don't I do something else? Only I'm useless to everything else, so I just have to carry on with writing. Are you carrying on with your writing? You're telling your own story, an actual autobiography. Most girls your age wouldn't have much to write about, but you're lucky in that respect because so many different things have happened to you. Good luck with it. Yours, Cam. Dear Miss Lawson, Jenny says that well, that's what I should call you, Miss Lawson, although you wrote Cam at the bottom of your letter. What sort of name is Cam? If you're called Camilla, then I think it's a lovely name and don't see why you want to muck it up. I had a friend in the other home called Camilla and she liked her name. I had a special way of saying it, Camilla, and she'd always giggle. She was only a baby, but very bright. Why don't you mind me being naughty? Actually, it's not always my fault that I get into trouble. People just pick on me, lots of people, but I won't name names because I don't tell tales. Not like some people. Do you like my drawing? <laughs> I liked yours. I thought they were funny. What do you mean? You hate writing. I think that's weird when it's what you do. I like writing. I think it's very easy. I just start and it goes on and on and on. The only trouble is that it hurts your hand and you get a big lump on your finger. And ink all over your hand and clothes and paper if some clueless toddler has been chewing on your felt tip. Are you having trouble writing your article about us? I could help you if you liked. I can tell you anything you need to know about me and the others. How about it? Yes, I am still writing my autobiography. I like that word. I asked Jenny and she said it's a story about yourself. And that's right. That's exactly what I'm writing. I'd let you have a look at it, but it's strictly personal. Don't let it take any notice of what that moron Justine read out. There are some really good bits, honest. Yours from your fellow writer, Tracy Beaker. RSVP. That means you've got to reply. Dear Tracy, thanks for your lovely letter. It made me laugh. Do you know what? I think you're a born writer. I could do with some help on my feature. Are you around next Saturday morning? Hope to see you then, Cam. I hate Camilla. I used to get teased rotten at school for having such a soppy name. Dear Camilla, it's not a soppy name. You've got to be proud of it. You want to try having a name like Tracy Beaker. Excuse this crummy writing paper. Jenny lent me the first lot, but she says I'm costing her a small fortune in paper and I can't give it a rest. So I borrowed this from one of the little ones. Isn't it yucky? I know. This is Goblinda, the goblin, and she's going to gob all over those daft fairies. Yes, I'll help you out on Saturday. If I'm there, of course. My mum often comes to take me out, although she may be abroad just now. I think she's just going to take me on a trip abroad too, but it mightn't be for a while, so I'll see you on Saturday morning probably. About what time? We have breakfast at 8.30 on Saturdays, and I always eat quickly, so about 8.35? Yours from your fellow, hang on, I'm not a fellow. Yours from another lady writer, Tracy, RSVP, so as I know what time to start writing. And waiting. Dear sister writer, see you Saturday morning. 8.35, impossible. <laughs> I look like this at 8.35, in bed. How about 10.35? Cam, sorry, Camilla, uh, P.S. I love Goblinda. Put her in a story. Imagine staying in your bed half the morning. She is lazy, and she was late even then. It was 10.41 before she turned up. I'd practically given up. 
She's supposed to be a professional writer, and yet she can't even keep an appointment on time. She's pretty hopeless, if you ask me. She didn't half muck up this morning. I got it all worked out. I was ready to fill her in on all the facts, mostly about me, of course. But I thought maybe she might fancy interviewing Peter, too, to balance things up. A girl's point of view and a boy's. No need to bother with any of the others. Cam's got this dinky little tape recorder, and after just one minute of instruction I mastered all the mechanism and had great fun fast-forwarding and rewinding and playing back. Had a little go first, trying out all my different accents, doing my Australian g'day routine and my American gangster and my special Donald Duck. But then I decided we'd better get down to business, and as I'm not the sort of girl to hog the limelight, I said Peter could go first. He backed away from the tape recorder as if it was a loaded gun. Don't be so silly, Peter. Just act normal and speak into it. What shall I say? Peter squeaked. I sighed impatiently. Just tell Cam your life story. But I haven't got a story. I couldn't think of anything to put when Elaine gave me that book, said Peter. I lived with my nan and she died. So I came here. That's all there is. That's OK, Peter. Don't let Tracy bully you into it. You don't have to say anything, said Cam. What a cheek. I'm not a bully. Huh. I was the kid who always got bullied. The other home I was in, there was this huge great teenage bloke and he was a really tough skinhead and he had those bother boots and I filled them up with custard for a joke and he didn't see the funny side of it and yet he didn't half look hilarious. All this frothy yellow liquid squishing up his trouser legs. So anyway, from then on my name was Mud and he really had it in for me. The things he used to do. I was about to launch into a long account but typical, typical that Justine Littlewood came barging over. It's not fair, miss. You're not letting, you're letting that stupid Tracy show off like mad and you're not giving any of us a go. You shut your face, blabbermouth, I said. She's not come to see you lot. She's come to see me, a strictly private appointment. So clear off. Isn't that right, Cam? Well, yes, I come to talk to you, Tracy, but we could all have a go on the tape recorder for a bit, she said. The gutless creep she is. She was there just to see me. We had a proper business appointment. All she had to do was tell Justine and the others to buzz off. It wouldn't have mattered if Peter stayed, because he's not really any bother. But the others, it was useless. Practically the whole morning was wasted. She let them all muck around on the tape recorder, and then some of the little E's wanted another go, drawing with her Mickey Mouse pen. And then Jenny came in with her coffee for Cam and Coke for us, and it was like some big party. Only I didn't feel like the birthday girl. I felt squeezed out to the edge again. After a bit, I stomped off. I kept looking back over my shoulder and I thought she didn't even notice. But then she sidled up. She still had baby Becky on one hip and little Wayne clinging to her leg like a limpet. She gave me a dig in the back with her Mickey Mouse pen. Hey, she said softly. Should we get started on your interview now then, Tracy? And that is where we will leave part three of The Story of Tracy Beaker by Jacqueline Wilson. I'll be back soon with the next part of this fantastic story and lots more stories and videos coming your way very soon. If you would like to subscribe or hit a like, that's always appreciated. Thanks for listening, guys. Take care. Bye bye.